Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to the 13th of our webinar series. Today's webinar is on the top 10, the Wireless Innovation Forum's top 10 most wanted wireless innovations. A uh, few administrative notes before we get started, and then I'll turn it over to our presenter, uh, Bob Schutz. So first, uh, for those who are interested, um, I always get asked, uh, yes, the slides will be provided, and the uh, place where you can find them at is wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars. Um, if you can't remember that or you need additional information, just feel free to contact me, Lee.Pucker, at wirelessinnovation.org. A uh, few notes on the tools we'll be using today. Um, your webinar interface has a, a number of features that you can use to, to, inter, uh, to work with us. Um, first, uh, you can minimize the screen and bring it back using the little arrow key on the side. Uh, audio mode, if you're having problems connecting, you can use your microphone and speakers, or if you need to, um, you can also use telephone and dial in directly, and there's a telephone line available for you. Uh, please be sure and put your audio pin in. Um, everybody is muted when they log in, and the only way I can unmute you if you decide you want to ask a question of the of the presenter is uh, through that audio pin. So make sure that you use it. There's a question windows on your interface. Um, as you type questions, I receive them, and I can either answer them directly or pass them on to the presenter so that the uh, 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 presenter can address them while the presentation is going. I talked with uh, Bob and he indicated he'd take questions as he goes today, so feel free to type your questions in as we go. Also, if you want to ask a question um, using your microphone, uh, there's a little hand button on your screen. If you click that, it raises your hand and then I can, uh, I can turn your microphone on so that you can ask your question. Uh, that's the instructions, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Schutz. Bob is the CTO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and he's going to be today's presenter. Uh, thanks, and welcome, Bob. Great. Thank you, Lee, um, and good morning. I'm Bob Schutz, and I'd like to welcome you to the Wireless Innovation Forum webinar on our top 10 most wanted wireless innovations. Uh, as you can see, we're on version 3 of the top 10 list, which is updated as needed as developments in wireless technology continue to advance it really a rapid pace. Uh, but before we get into specifics of the top 10 list, I'd like to put the list in the context of what the Wireless Forum Innovation Forum is and why, it, why the list is an important tool to drive research and development for members of the forum as well as other stakeholders within the wireless community. Uh, this includes commercial, government, and academic stakeholders. Um, Stephanie or, or Lee, if you go to the next slide. Um, if we look at the Wireless Innovation Forum, uh, we can see it was, uh, it was actually established in uh, 1996. Uh, it's a nonprofit mutual benefit corporation dedicated to advocating innovative uses of spectrum and advancing radio technology that supports essential or mission critical communications worldwide. Four members bring a broad uh, base of experience to software defined radios, cognitive radios, dynamic spectrum access and all of the related technologies uh, in this very diverse market and at all levels of the wireless value chain. Um, the, the goal is, of course, to provide enhanced value, reduce uh, total uh, life cycle and cost of ownership, and accelerate deployments of standardized families of products, technologies, services, and uh, uh, in, in all fields of wireless communication. Uh, the forum has been and continues to act as the premier venue uh, for its members to collaborate to achieve these objectives, providing opportunities to network with customers, partners, and competitors, uh, educational, uh, educate decision makers, and develop and expand markets uh, and to advance relevant technologies. Uh, the graphics on this slide uh, shows the organizational structure the forum is defined by its members in April 2013. Uh, I should note that the forum is in the process of forming a new committee, a U.S. regional committee modeled after the structure of the uh, 
CCSCA, which is the Coordinating Committee on International SCA Standards. Um, this uh, will support multi-stakeholder groups in development uh, of recommendations for spectrum sharing. Um, a description of this group can be found in the forum's filing for comments on the FCC uh, FNPRM, which is the further notice of proposed rulemaking in regards to the uh, 3.55 to 3.65 megahertz band. It can also be downloaded from the forum's uh, website. Um, this may sound like it's a, a fairly narrowly focused effort, but the forum is really establishing itself as a host, as a host organization for a broad range of technologies to support software-defined radios, cognitive radios, uh, dynamic spectrum access, spectrum access systems, um, spectrum standard resource formats, among many other related technologies uh, to support uh, spectrum consumption models and so forth as, uh, as the industry is moving from a dedicated uh, spectrum uh, assignment to uh, shared spectrum assignments. Um, if we go to slide three, uh, you'll see that uh, you, you know what what is most wanted, what our most wanted wireless innovations are, are innovations that are technical, business, or regulatory uh, that have significant impact that, if realized, uh, would would address the various shortcomings in wireless communications. And if this is all done from the point of view of, of different stakeholders, uh, it's important that multiple stakeholders, whether they're from the technical uh, community, business, regulatory, academic, government, um, that there's collaboration and, and uh, that's something that the forum is, is really focused on doing, is providing a collaborative environment to address some of the, the really key gaps in wireless communications. Um, in, uh, about, about the list itself, uh, in 2009, the forum, the forum launched a survey to identify key priorities for the coming years, and 85% uh, of the respondents to the, the survey uh, responded that we need a roadmap of key technologies that are needed throughout the wireless value chain. And the development of this list really uh, came from that. Uh, in the first half of calendar year 2013, the forum created a roadmap committee uh, that was chaired by uh, John Gossner, uh, who was the uh, technical director at the time of the forum. And it consisted of group leaders that included committees, SIGs, working group, task groups. And the objective of, of, of this committee really was to define what, what were the gaps in wireless communications and what the 10 most wanted uh, innovation, a list of the 10 most wanted innovations should be. And by the end of that calendar year, or by the end of uh, next calendar year, this, I'm sorry, this calendar year, we do expect to have version four of that list under review and, and uh, ready for publication. Um, if you go on to the next slide, uh, you can see the high-level process uh, that we use uh, for uh, development of the list. Uh, the Spectrum Innovation Committee manages the existing um, or proposed communication architectures and um, uh, works with SIGs and, and technical committees to uh, define projects to really identify what the key business, uh, regulatory, and technology gaps are. From that, uh, that's distilled down, and from that, uh, we generate a list that we maintain uh, that uh, identifies areas where we apply our resources on projects and on, and on activities and establishing um, uh, collaborative environments in order to address the, these very critical issues in, in uh, the wireless community. If you go on to slide five um, and we look at the organization uh, you know, of, of the forum itself or of the list itself, um, we have uh, software development, uh, radio development, uh, network and systems, and regulatory uh, issues uh, that, or, that are organized um, uh, into uh, groups that we, we focus uh, evaluation of gaps for, uh, for inclusion in the top ten list. Um, if, as technology advances, 
we often uh, we often find that uh, some of these gaps are solved or are being are are moving from uh, innovation into industrialization, and they drop off the list, and we uh, we then add new uh, uh, or have the ability to add new uh, uh, is issues to the list. So with that, um, let's get into the uh, innovations themselves. And uh, the first innovation is listed on slide six. Uh, it's really based on techniques for efficient software porting between heterogeneous platforms and generic development tools. Um, the goal, of course, uh, in, in this is to reduce development time and cost. And it's important that software can be written uh, easily and be portable from platform to platform. Uh, SVR development processes today are mostly uh, informal or uh, need uh, continued refinement in their definitions to really allow exchange of information between uh, different systems and to simplify the porting of software across heterogeneous platforms. And the forum has worked for many years uh, in development of, of SVA applications and components and platforms to support advances in software uh, configuration architectures. Um, what, uh, uh, what we're continuing to do is, is we're continuing to define IDLs, which are interface design languages, and AEPs, which are application environment protocols. And we've actually moved what, what was uh, a few years ago, um, SCA version 2.2.2. Uh, we're now working on, on version 4.1 and have a significant effort uh, to advance, uh, uh, advance uh, the ability to efficiently port uh, software between, between platforms. The real power in, in an SDA environment is that the software can configure the behavior of the system independent of the hardware that, that's being used as a host. So uh, we've identified this as a key um, you know, a key area uh, where we need uh, need more innovation. And if you look at uh, the next slide, you'll see some of the forum activities that are uh, that are supporting this. Um, the CCSCA, which is the Coordinating Committee on International SCA Standards, is a major effort within the forum to continue evolving and refining the communication uh, architecture. Um, and addresses improvements in porting of software and the integrity of imported software across heterogeneous uh, platforms and processes. Uh, the forum was and continues to be the center of mass for this effort, uh, working both in Europe uh, and, and the United States and internationally on the development of, and refinement of SCA. And uh, the latest documents developed by the, S, uh, the CCSCA provide definitions uh, for improved processes for AEPs and IDL performance and are available uh, uh, from the forum and, and can be downloaded. Um, another interesting uh, forum project is the, uh, the Integrated Communication Systems Modeling Group. Um, as you can see from the diagram, uh, SysML and UML tools are used to model computationally independent models and platform-specific implementations, as well as the standard PIM and PISM models, uh, the platform-independent and platform-specific models uh, that are normally addressed. Um, this simplifies the conceptual process of porting software across heterogeneous platforms. Um, this project is nearing completion, and I believe the final report uh, on this project is due out this year. We go on to the next slide. Uh, we can look at uh, the second innovation um, on our list, and that's the certification process for third-party waveform software. One of the main benefits of software-defined radios resides in the ability to decouple the signal processing software from the radio hardware, enabling really a multiplicity of communication protocols to run on the same radio. Um, your cell phone is an example of how well this can provide benefits to users. Currently, however, particularly in, in tactical communications and mission critical communications, radio manufacturers are usually the one that implement the software on their own hardware, which is really unlike the computer domain where third-party written communication protocol software is, is rare. 
um, in, in SDR, uh, in software-defined radios, um, it's normally the hardware provider and is, is in control of the porting process. And while you know, the heterogeneous nature of the platform and, and the liability for performance of the radio can be finger pointed back to that, uh, uh, to that manufacturer, uh, it would be much better if we had a certification process that would enable third-party software to be used across multiple platforms. And this would significantly reduce development cost and time to market. It would also foster um, the development of third-party applications that run uh, in conjunction with the, uh, with the SDR software in the POSX environment that would allow uh, in, in industry uh, of third-party developers to uh, begin to support the market uh, as, as, you know, as SEA, as a host environment. Um, problem is even more acute when you start uh, moving away from uh, strictly software-defined radios to cognitive radios where you have learning algorithms and adaptive protocols that dynamically modify the behavior of the radio and the behavior, its behavior in the network. Well, this can be a, a serious issue in network stability. Um, going on to the next slide, you can see some of the forum activities uh, where we're actively involved in collaborating both within the United States and with international partners to address this problem. Uh, working with uh, the Joint Tactical Networking Center, uh, JTNC, and the European uh, Secure Software Radio Program, or ESOR, uh, the forum uh, supports test interoperability standards and has actually produced a test and evaluation certification guide for SEA-based systems. Um, as uh, cognitive radios and more adaptive uh, networks are, are uh, sharing spectrum, um, this the ability to uh, have third-party testing of the behavior of radios as they enter networks, leave networks, are provisioned in networks uh, becomes even more important. So there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done to make sure that uh, this, is, this is done in a way that, uh, that protects uh, both existing systems and new systems as, as they come online. Our uh, third innovation is shown on the next slide. Um, and this is, uh, this is really focused on receiver specifications. Um, there's a growing movement to encourage spectrum sharing, and, the, and that will be a significant enabler for cognitive radio systems. However, existing spectrum users have a reasonable expectation that new in-band and adjacent band users will not impair their system operation. Um, historically, this has been managed through a variety of standards and regu regulations primarily focused on transmitter parameters and sometimes with unexpected consequences and, and at significant cost to uh, both uh, government and private industry in attempts to deploy systems. Uh, the form believes that a long-term uh, strategy uh, will require us to, to enable both transmitter and receiver characteristics to be known, uh, discoverable, and be part of an integral part of, of spectrum regulation and management. So specifically adding focus on, re on regulating receiver performance can bring much benefit in terms of spectral efficiency, such as uh, uh, through such regulations, while at the same time reducing risk for new markets and new market technologies. Um, on the next slide, uh, you can see some of the form activities that are, uh, that, that are addressing uh, this, uh, this particular um, innovation uh, or this particular gap. Um, and to, re to address receiver performance issues, uh, the forum formed a receiver performance guideline and evaluation uh, criteria task group. This effort has been heavily influenced by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. It's often referred to as the PCAS report on spectrum sharing and the need for making uh, repurposing of government spectrum uh, for commercial use. Um, this uh, effort uh, involves, uh, is involved, has evolved into a working group and will directly support development of a working group under the U.S. Regional uh, Multi-Stakeholder Committee that uh, I mentioned earlier that 
uh, that the forum is in the process of, of forming. Um, this working group will focus on research and development of what we call harm interference threshold models that accurately represent standard receiver architectures. This differs a bit from the harm claim threshold model uh, definition being worked on uh, by the FCC and in particular uh, the TAC or Technical Advisory Council. Um, the, the, and that's because the forum is approaching the problem uh, from receiver interference from the perspective of the physics of receivers and, and propagation characteristics, not receiver harm, which is inherently related to policy, which is really outside the scope of, of, uh, uh, of what the forum does and, and is really the domain of the FCC uh, and the and NTIA and the ITU regions that uh, the forum supports. If we go on uh, to the next slide, uh, we see a couple of, of other innovations that uh, are central to what the forum's doing. Um, uh, innovation number four is development of low-cost, wide spectral range RF front ends. Uh, we, we certainly need front ends with multi-octave and uh, contiguous uh, uh, behavior uh, for both receiver and transmitters. Um, Innovation number five are techniques to minify, minimize um, power amplifier spectral regrowth. Um, certainly, uh, as we begin to pack uh, diverse or heterogeneous networks in uh, the same spectrum, uh, we, have to, we have to be very careful that our receivers and transmitters uh, behave properly, and spectral regrowth is, is often an issue that, uh, uh, that we need to, need to account for. And then there's uh, increased uh, communication time on uh, battery charge by an order of magnitude. Um, wireless communication inherently runs is mobile and inherently runs on batteries rather than uh, wired power. So um, we, we certainly uh, encourage the development of, um, of new battery technology uh, to support uh, you know, continued uh, advancements in the ability to, uh, uh, to be mobile and, and support a mobile environment. So, you know, low-cost uh, transmit and receiver front ends uh, are certainly uh, critical, uh, you know, techniques, uh, algorithms, software, hardware, or mixed techniques that significantly uh, reduce spectral growth uh, with a target of minus uh, 70 dBc in wideband and uh, uh, greater than 20 meg and greater than 20 megahertz. Um, uh, you know, our, our key areas where uh, uh, we're focusing uh, efforts. Um, the use of battery power on communication devices uh, require the user to carry extra batteries or have frequent access to battery charge facilities. And, and of course, um, you know, one solution to that is simply better batteries. If we go on to the next slide, we can look at some of the forum activities uh, that are in support of uh, of these, uh, these three innovations. Uh, innovation four and five are primary innovations in device physics at the physical layer of the communication platform. Uh, the forum has always made uh, this a focus, particularly in its, its annual conferences, with a significant number of paper and technical uh, tracks dedicated to the advancement uh, in device physics and component technology that improve physical layer performance. Um, Innovation six certainly can be uh, improved by advancements in device physics and battery technology. But uh, you know, as we got into looking at this uh, innovation, we realized that there's even more room for improvement, uh, certainly uh, on the order of magnitude, uh, on an order of magnitude, uh, by understanding why longer battery life is desirable. Or simply put, the more data you can uh, transmit and receive. Um, once we understand how we can effectively get more battery life by lowering, we, we can understand that we can actually get more battery life by actually lowering the number of bits that need to be communicated and, and uh, the information that needs to be uh, transmitted, uh, we can achieve the same result as if we had more battery power. And if you look at a typical OSI model, um, there are really opportunities that exist that at all layers of the stack. Uh, from the application and presentation layers all the way down through the data link and physical layers. Um, the key is 
uh, that once we understand the context of data and how data gets transmitted uh, to information, how information in context uh, becomes knowledge and how knowledge in context because it becomes wisdom or understanding, uh, we can begin to understand how, uh, how we can uh, develop systems uh, for communications that actually impart uh, an understanding uh, across the wireless domain uh, that, that simply requires fewer bits. And this is one area where uh, there's a real promise to, to get the type of, or, you know, the order of magnitude uh, type reduction in battery load uh, that, uh, that, su that can support this. Um, for example, uh, if uh, anyone is aware of the AWARE program uh, that was run by DARPA a number of years ago, um, you know, an example that they use is that if I'm communicating to you that I see a horse, uh, I, can, I can communicate that information in a number of ways. I can send you uh, an uncompressed uh, video uh, of, of you know, a high definition a video of a horse running and take hundreds of megabytes of, of bandwidth. I can send you a compressed uh, video and you know, use just a, a few megahertz of bandwidth. I can send you a photograph uh, and use kilobits of bandwidth, or I can send you a simple statement that says, I see a horse, and, and send just a few bits uh, or, or bytes of information. Uh, the key is um, I need to understand the context that you understand uh, what I'm trying to communicate to you to efficiently pass that information on to you. And so there's within the uh, uh, Cognitive Radio Working Group, there, there's an, an, a lot of uh, effort going into context-aware systems that significantly lowers the number of bits of communication that needs to be transmitted uh, to impart understanding of information, knowledge, and, and uh, understanding. Um, if we go on to the next slide, uh, we, we get in a bit to the context-aware cognitive radio um, effort that's, uh, that's going on in the uh, cognitive radio working group. Uh, this is uh, new to the list in, in this version, um, and it really addresses the methods, tools, architectures, and languages that need to be developed to enable cognitive radios to incorporate contextual reasoning into their decision process. Uh, so it's by adapting uh, dynamic context, cognitive radio algorithms can be automatically matched to changing conditions, wireless network performance can be significantly improved, uh, and user performance enhanced in network management time and cost reduced. And uh, on the next slide, we can look at some of the activities uh, within the forum that are actually uh, supporting um, this uh, initiative. So to support development of, of context-aware cognitive radios, the Cognitive Radio Working Group began development of what's called the Information Processing Reference Architecture to model cognitive behavior of systems. Uh, volume 3 of this architecture is focused on context-aware cognitive radios and uh, the tools and architectures uh, needed to allow benefits from context-aware systems uh, to uh, improve communication uh, processes. Um, volume 3 of the IPA is complete and will be presented at WinCom Europe uh, 2014 in early November in, in Rome and certainly uh, encourage uh, anyone on the call uh, if, they're, if they're in uh, Europe at the time uh, to uh, consider going to the uh, European conference. Uh, there, are, there are a significant number of very important papers are being presented and, and uh, the IPA uh, Volume 3 is, is certainly one of them. Uh, the Cognitive Radio Working Group is also heavily involved in evaluation of, of what we call big or what are big data tools for big RF solutions and has published a number of papers on this subject. I believe uh, they've published five papers to date on this um, and many of these papers are really uh, centered around uh, big RF solutions. Uh, if you understand big data and the unstructured nature of, of databases and how MapReduce uh, algorithms work and how uh, the underlying 
tool set for uh, big data analytics work, uh, you will you will have a pretty good understanding of of what we're doing with with big RF solutions in in these tools. Um, there's a, a significant uh, um, benefit to having databases that are not tightly coupled uh, being analyzed by big RF solutions to allow the, the type of an activity and, um, and the type of, of configurability that are required as you start sharing spectrum. And uh, so the, uh, uh, the forum is very heavily involved in evaluation of these tools and the architectures that are needed uh, to, uh, to support this. And there are papers being presented in, uh, at, at, uh, in the European conference in November uh, on, this, on this subject as well. Um, so the forum is uh, also involved in develop of, of what we call a wisdom model which relates cognitive behavior uh, based on judgment and analysis to routine, be uh, routine behavior of systems uh, based on structures, both uh, real uh, and, uh, and in the information space. Um, typical assignment of uh, spectrum in uh, real world systems uh, is dedicated when you start adding uh, judgment and optimization uh, based on uh, information that's correlated and analyzed with big RF tools, um, you, you begin to have much more adaptive systems, which really begin to solve uh, or help us solve the problem of, of insufficient bandwidth when bandwidth is, is uh, statically assigned. So as we look at dynamic assignment of, of bandwidth, uh, we really need a new tool set and a new language and a new set of processes to, to help support this. So um, that's, that's a, a pretty significant effort going on within the Cognitive Radio Working Group uh, uh, to address these issues. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, um, our innovation number eight is, uh, is really centered on uh, interference mitigation techniques. Um, you know, innovations um, are, are sought on how to deal with software-defined radios and cognitive radios and, and how it might uh, alter uh, system design and trade-offs uh, uh, to allow better rejection of interference without exponential growth in cost associated with more traditional solutions. As uh, SCA was first deployed, uh, the billions of dollars spent on government programs um, really were the result of, of a very brute force um, uh, approach to providing uh, very sophisticated RF front ends that, uh, that would allow the type of adaptive behavior uh, that, was, that was envisioned for the JTRS program and envisioned for mission critical communications. Um, if we have uh, much lower cost systems that, uh, that support uh, much wider um, uh, bandwidths and, and uh, also support interfer interference mitigation techniques, better filters, uh, you know, better, uh, better um, receiver performance characteristics, uh, we, can, uh, we can begin to really benefit uh, from uh, better um, adaptive power control, uh, adaptive beam forming, um, data rate control, uh, adaptive frequency control, receiver filtering. Uh, we can have improved roaming characteristics. And, uh, and change channel coding algorithms is necessary uh, to ensure um, communications are, are delivered with the like, with the appropriate, uh, uh, with the appropriate uh, assurance that the communication is being received and, and, uh, and, and properly uh, looked at by the user. Um, many of these techniques uh, are already used in advanced communication but uh, others are not used because of design trade-offs or other factors that, uh, that may not be uh, favor their deployment. Um, you know, it's uh, recognized that, uh, you know, cognitive radio frequency techniques um, are, uh, uh, you know, are, are going to put even more stress on, on these environments. If you go on to the next uh, slide, uh, you'll see really what the uh, form activities are. and, and you know, the bottom line is the forum has thousands of public works in uh, conference papers, proceedings, and in workshops that address, you know, the fundamental issues with device physics 
in, in behavior of, of systems uh, you know, at the interface between uh, the uh, transmitters and receivers, um, at, the, uh, uh, at the air interface, uh, antenna characteristics, uh, sampling uh, um, processes that, that are used to uh, uh, help improve uh, RF uh, uh, bandwidth. Um, the, uh, the issue or the key is here that you can go to the uh, wireless innovation form library and look uh, at, at uh, thousands of proceedings that uh, really are, are address this issue. Uh, the forum um, works very hard to make sure that uh, the latest innovations in device physics uh, are, uh, are brought to the community and, and discussed and an excellent way to find out what these are to attend uh, the annual conferences both in Europe and the United States and to uh, go through the uh, you know, the, the wealth of information that's contained in the archives within the forum itself. Um, if we go on to the next slide, uh, we can see that uh, on innovation number nine is really uh, focused on standardized uh, computer uh, inter, uh, interoperability uh, policy language for cognitive radios. Uh, the ability to operate legally and and with agility across multiple bands in different places using policies as a means to check whether you're, you're legal and eligible and, and can be uh, provisioned into a network or your network can occupy um, a shared spectrum uh, really is, is going to require uh, or constitute uh, uh, methods of policy awareness. Um, these policies can be included in, in regulatory or system specific policies, they can be hard or software policies, uh, and can determine when spectrum is considered as opportunistic as well as providing constraints on how these spectrums are used. Um, future innovations are really required to allow regulatory policies and rules for dynamic policy-based radio control to be automatically interpreted and executed. Um, and this is certainly to extend the core ontology uh, as defined in the forms uh, modeling for mobility and uh, makes it uh, capable to express and use cases to support uh, policy-based radio control. Um, this is being um, explored by IEEE DICEBAN uh, P1900.5 uh, and uh, the forum is, is very heavily involved in, uh, in all of the P1900 uh, activities. To go on to the next slide, um, you'll see some of the um, foreign activities that relate to this. Um, certainly uh, the Cognitive Radio Working Group and uh, the, M the MLM or the Modeling Language for Mobility Group um, are, are working uh, to support policy control of, uh, of radios and networks within uh, both dedicated and shared spectrum. Um, and as the wireless in industry moves from static frequency assignment uh, to dynamic and, and shared spectrum, uh, the ability to develop policies to provide appropriate context for heterogeneous networks to operate and coexist uh, becomes uh, really much more important. Um, four members are actively involved in supporting developments uh, such as the uh, spectrum consumption model, uh, spectrum access systems, and uh, of course big RF tools for national, regional, local, and uh, spectrum analysis for um, uh, dynamic access uh, systems. Um, so if we go on to the, uh, uh, the next slide, uh, we can see uh, innovation number 10 uh, is really focused on um, a flexible uh, regulatory framework for uh, temporary cooperative and opportunistic spectrum. Um, traditional international and, and domestic regulatory frameworks uh, governing access to RF spectrum have traditionally been based on static frequency allocations and assignments. And uh, while emerging multi-band cognitive radios and dynamic spectrum access technologies are being introduced uh, under more modern, flexible, market-based regulatory policies, um, in some countries, uh, a, a new supplemental framework that can overlay existing schemes uh, to further uh, allow innovation technology and, and allow such technologies to enable um, an innovative framework uh, uh, 
uh, really, really needs to move forward uh, rapidly. Um, a, a new flexible framework applies across multiple bands. Uh, that applies across multiple bands and uh, wireless services that enable coexistence of commercial and mission critical communications is, is vitally important. Uh, so new rules need to be developed and, and authorized uh, to allow advanced wireless devices and systems to meet certain reconfigurability requirements and to operate across a wide swath of frequency bands uh, on cooperation on temporary cooperative or opportunistic basis. On the next slide uh, are listed a number of form, uh, important form activities uh, that relate to this. Um, key focus of the forum is supporting development of, uh, a key focus is developing uh, flexible regulatory frameworks. Um, we're actively supporting the FCC and NTIA as well as all IT regions and development of advanced technologies required to develop spectrum sharing. A uh, major undertaking in form has been the development of an annual report uh, entitled uh, Dynamic Spectrum Sharing. Uh, this report is being ready for ballot and, and release. It's over 170 pages and contains a, a wealth of information, including a comprehensive list of spectrum measurement studies, uh, summary, or summary of regulations, um, economic analysis of spectrum sharing, uh, and discussion of business models. Um, it also includes a list of uh, future considerations or gaps in, in spectrum sharing, uh, definition of key technologies and, and studies and, and terms. Um, it has a list of national and international field trials and test beds, as well as uh, relevant standards and developments that are under test. It has a summary of ongoing research program in a review of key technologies. Uh, so I'd certainly encourage, uh, once uh, this report is validated out and gets released, uh, that uh, uh, you uh, download this uh, from the forum's website. And, um, and uh, you know, it, it, it will, uh, the uh, plan is to update it every year, um, and it will be, uh, continue to be an, an important uh, tool to drive forward in, uh, in uh, dynamic spectrum sharing technologies. Another area the forum is actively supporting is in development of a standard uh, spectrum resource format, or what's called SERF, um, or SSRF. Uh, and, and just this week, uh, the forum released an internal document for review on what's called OpenSERF software library uh, to support uh, database structures for use by spectrum access models. Uh, that will support uh, emerging spectrum consumption models, and uh, this work uh, directly supports requirements for spectrum sharing. So that is uh, another uh, area of focus where the forum is working to provide the underlying technology that will enable spectrum access control systems and, and uh, spectrum consumption models to be realized that will open up um, spectrum sharing uh, technology. Um, so those are the uh, those are the top ten lists as it exists today. Uh, we are continuing to review this list, uh, and and our plan is to uh, have it updated this year. And uh, and so version four of the list certainly will be out by the time uh, the forum has its annual annual conference uh, next year. Uh, and uh, so any uh, you know any input that anyone on the call has uh, on. Uh, on gaps that they see or that or that their company has that they would like addressed. Certainly, um, you know, we, we uh, encourage, uh, whether you're members of the forum or, or not members of the forum, uh, for you to get involved uh, and hopefully join the forum and not only identify these gaps, but uh, also work with uh, other research organizations and uh, government and industry um, leaders in these fields uh, to develop um, solutions so we can uh, continue to evolve wireless communications. So if you go on to the next slide, um, you know, really what are the next steps? Um, you know, is, is really to promote and support research and development programs uh, and, and to continually evolve wireless communications. Uh, the Wireless Innovation Forum has a number of, of key 
uh, memberships and partners. Uh, we work closely with IEEE, uh, OMG, uh, other organizations in the wireless community to make sure that, uh, that we're properly supporting uh, wireless communications as, uh, as new business cases evolve, as new, new regulations are formed. And, and policies are, are being put in place. And the Wireless Innovation Forum is really focused on the science and technology uh, that underlies these innovations. And so we support all of these organizations as well as uh, a broad uh, range of organizations within the business community, the academic community, and, and regulatory government uh, uh, community. Um, in, in moving wireless technology forward. Um, go on to the next slide. Uh, you'll see that we uh, uh, you know, have recently uh, put out a project survey uh, asking for um, our members to, to respond uh, on what they'd like to see added to the uh, top 10 wireless list. Um, many of these members are are very consumed in supporting uh, in supporting uh, some of the innovations that we've just discussed, but some of the uh, some of the uh, suggestions that they came up with um, are shown on this slide. One is certainly to investigate um, orthogonal frequency uh, assignment as waveforms uh, uh, and, and approaches for spectral reuse uh, in limited frequency bands. Um, there's often a discussion in the world, uh, do we need more bandwidth or do we need more infrastructure? And you know, if you, if you look at wireless communications in the same way that you look at voice communication, there are 7 billion people on this planet and we all seem to communicate effectively in about 8 kilohertz of spectrum uh, when we talk to each other. Um, of course, we uh, inherently have power control, there are proximity issues. Um, but um, you can certainly make a case that what we need is better utilization of spectrum. Spectrum is, is actually in wireless communication. You know, spectrum is actually the oxygen of wireless communication. And, uh, and we need to make sure that we have appropriate policies and an ability to reuse spectrum as much as possible. But we also need development of infrastructure uh, that supports um, you know, the, the concept that's often used in satellites, such as colors of, of regions and orthogonal frequency assignments, and the ability to overlay uh, different heterogeneous wireless uh, communication systems on top of each other in a non-interference way. Um, another, uh, you know, another uh, issue that came up is uh, considering, uh, you know, uh, the forum has been involved in software-defined radios for and driving that those markets for some time, uh, as well as cognitive radios. Um, there are certainly uh, software-defined networks and uh, uh, network function virtualization are uh, certainly hot topics in the, uh, in the wireless community and wired community these days. Um, uh, the the uh, issue is that uh, uh, we need innovation at really all levels of the OSI model and the communication stack. And um, members of the forum, uh, particularly those that are working on context-aware systems, work uh, on everything from the application through the presentation all the way down through the data link and physical layers. Um, so I do expect to see us evolve more in, uh, in, in just uh, uh, the lower and lower end of the stack and, and as we go up in, into the host layers, particularly as we begin to support application development in SEA environments. Um, so, you know, we're, we're considering, you know, what innovations that, that may be central to uh, these issues that may, we may want to bring into the, uh, uh, into our list. Um, another, another issue that came up was to advocate for completely dynamic use of spectrum without uh, any licensing requirement. Um, certainly, that would be uh, uh, that, that would be a, a good thing to do. Um, it would be nice if we could do that, uh, but it, it certainly puts governments in a difficult position that make billions of dollars on selling and regulating spectrum. And uh, and it's important to note also that unlicensed does not mean unregulated. 
and opportunistic uh, use of unregulated spectrum or unlicensed spectrum uh, is, is certainly a, uh, a, a position the forum takes, but that is itself a form of regulation. So uh, we, we will never go without regulation, but uh, um, you know, we, we certainly do advocate uh, within the forum uh, to uh, use opportunistically uh, underutilized spectrum. Um, and on the last slide uh, I have today, if you go on to the next slide, I uh, just want to talk a little about uh, innovation um, and, and why the forum is, is really an important vehicle for innovation in the wireless community. I think my favorite quote on uh, innovation is that creative, creativity is uh, thinking new things and innovation is doing new things. Uh, it's from uh, Theodore Levitt. Um, the, the issue is that the forum plays a very important role in taking what is what we realize are gaps in in wireless communications when we're inspired to take approaches that remove these gaps or barriers to deployment, whether it's business, technical, or or uh, regulatory. Um, the forum is is an excellent organization uh, in its participation in conferences, working groups, SIGs its support of, of uh, both academic and, and government entities as well as a, a wide range of commercial organizations. And take inspiration and really turn them into innovations where uh, the proof of concept is done to the point where industrialization by our members or by the wireless community can, can take place. And um, I've got a list here of uh, uh, wireless uh, forum groups um, certainly encourage everyone on the call to uh, consider joining these groups and you can certainly contact me by email uh, and I can help you figure out how to how to be involved in these groups and, and who to contact to, to get more information or understand what uh, what's going on in the forum. Um, so that's uh, you know that's what I have today. Um, I certainly appreciate those that dialed in and uh, um, and listen to a review of, of our current status of the wireless uh, uh, top 10 list or top 10 innovations. Um, and if you have any questions, we'd be glad to, uh, glad to answer those now or uh, uh, you know, we, can, we can move forward and, and look forward to hopefully your participation in development of version 4 of this list. So uh, that's what I have. Uh, Lee, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Bob. Um, so are there any questions? If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand uh, using the control interface or else uh, type your question into the questions window and we'll give a moment for, for people to type in their questions. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Uh, just a couple of comments and wrap up. Um, our next webinar is going to be next Friday, and it's on the Wireless Innovation Forum Advocacy Agenda. The webinar is going to be given by Bruce Oberleith. Uh, he's with Motorola Solutions, and he's the chair of the Wireless Innovation Forum. Um, if uh, anybody has ideas for uh, other webinars we should be giving, our, our request for proposals for next webinars is open. Um, if you want to give a webinar or you have an idea for a webinar, please feel free to contact me at lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org. And finally, we'll uh, send out a webinar satisfaction survey shortly. Um, you know, please complete it. It helps us to make sure that these are giving value to you and, and that our future webinars are, uh, are for, you know, doing what the community needs. Uh, so with that, I'll give a last call for questions. Okay. Well, thanks, Bob, once again for doing uh, making this presentation today. Um, I appreciate it, and I and I know those who are who are listening in appreciate it as well. And um, I'll uh, look forward to seeing everybody next Friday for the uh, webinar on our advocacy agenda. Uh, thanks, everyone, and have a good day. <laughs>